Hi guys, now we're ready to finally start talking about hypothesis testing. This is when the class gets really exciting because this is when we start to talk about the types of analyses that researchers use when they do studies and report results in manuscripts and journal articles. So hypothesis testing is all about determining if results are statistically significant, meaning that we're pretty confident that whatever we observed in the sample would probably also be observed in the population at large. So this is exciting stuff. All right, so some topics to cover. Um, just reviewing the scientific method, you've seen the, sh the picture that I'm going to show you here in a minute. You've seen it when we talked in chapter one about the scientific method. But I want to review it because it's the basis for the four steps of the hypothesis test that you see on your screen there. We're going to talk about all four of those steps in detail with examples. It's really important that you understand those four steps because you will be using them for the rest of the semester. Then we are going to talk about effect size, which is just determining how strong of an effect is there between an independent variable and a dependent variable. And this really goes beyond statistical significance. So it's more than just saying, okay, well, it's highly unlikely that we would have seen this result due to chance. Therefore, it's likely that we would observe this actual result in the population at large. That's statistical significance. Effect size goes beyond that to say, okay, well, how large of an effect did this have? How effective was the training or the drug or whatever the independent variable was on the dependent variable? And then type one and type two error are just two different situations that can arise when you're looking at hypothesis testing. And we'll talk about each one of those. So here's a flow chart of the scientific method. You guys saw this in chapter one when we were introducing all the concepts that we would be talking about this semester. And just to give you a review of it, because it is really relevant to those four steps of the hypothesis test, the four steps that are relevant to scientific method, remember, science begins here with the hypothesis. So these darker green squares are relevant to the four steps of the hypothesis test. And usually research starts with an observation. And just a simple observation like, oh, you know, some students or some people who take the SAT tend to perform better than others. So that could be your observation. You're observing the dependent variable. You're observing SAT scores. Then you can make some sort of intuitive guess about what causes those differences. So maybe some people are better test takers than others, or maybe some people are just smarter than others. So this is just kind of the normal thought process that everybody uses. Then it starts to get into the scientific method and hypothesis testing when you begin to consult past research or do a little bit of digging on your own to make an informed guess about what caused it or a hypothesis. So maybe you find out after asking several people who've taken the SAT that those who tended to do really, really well took this Kaplan test prep course for the SAT. So maybe you could develop a hypothesis saying that individuals who take the Kaplan test prep do better on the SAT than those who don't. And that would be called an alternative hypothesis, which is just based on your expectation of what you expect to find in your study that you haven't collected data for yet. Then there's something called the null hypothesis, which just goes against everything that you expect. Null meaning, you know, not. It's going against what you're expecting. And the null hypothesis could be that maybe Kaplan test prep has no effect on test scores, or maybe it decreases test scores, who knows? But it goes against your hypothesis, your alternative hypothesis, that you think Kaplan will actually improve SAT scores. So that's relevant to step one of the hypothesis test. Then step two, so you've, you're gonna collect some data, which for our purposes, you'll already have data given to you, and you wanna determine the criteria for significance. Now, the criteria for significance is called the critical region, and it's really just all about the minimum z-score, in our case, needed to consider a sample to be statistically significant. And we'll talk in great detail about the critical region, but instead of now, you know, before we were saying an extreme z-score is two or more, now we're going to actually have a specific z-score based on a couple pieces of information to tell us whether or not a sample mean is significant, meaning that it's extreme enough for us to be pretty confident that whatever we observed in our sample would probably be observed in the population at large. 
So that's step two of the hypothesis test. Then the next step, we actually test the hypothesis. So for our purposes, where we are now, this will involve calculating a z-score. And so far, we've only been talking about studies where we compare a sample mean to a population mean. And we are going to go beyond that in this class, but it's a good starting point. It's a pretty basic type of study, and that's where we're at right now. So in this lecture, all of our examples will be based on that type of study, comparing a sample to a population. And we'll be working with z-scores when we go to test our hypothesis. So we calculate our test statistic in step three, and we see if it falls in this critical region, this criteria for significance. If it exceeds the critical z value, that's the minimum z-score needed to conclude that our sample mean is stat statistically significant. So we have our sample, let's say we collected data from a sample of people who took the SAT and also took the Kaplan test prep. And then we test our hypothesis by comparing the mean SAT score for that sample to the current population mean for the SAT test. And then we end up with a better understanding of nature. Let's say that the test statistic doesn't fall in the critical region. Well, then we can say that maybe Kaplan doesn't actually work for the population at large. Maybe just a couple people that I talked to that I based my hypothesis on, maybe they were just kind of an anomaly and they weren't really representative of what we would actually see in the population. Or maybe we reject the null hypothesis, that notion that maybe Kaplan doesn't have an effect, and we still have a better understanding of nature. Maybe we should take Kaplan if we want to do better on the SAT because it appears to work in the population at large based on this sample. We're confident that we would see similar results in the population. So I'm going to go through examples and details about all these steps, but I just wanted to initially tie the steps of the hypothesis test to the scientific method that you were exposed to early on in the semester. So step one is really broken up into two parts. The first part is stating the alternative hypothesis, or in other words, what you expect to happen based on past research. So in this example, I'm going to show you all the different possible alternative hypotheses you could have if we were looking at comparing a sample of Kaplan test prep recipients who took the SAT to the population of SAT takers showing you every possible alternative hypothesis that you could generate from this example. In practice, you guys will be given a specific scenario and you'll only have, you know, one A, B, or C type of option. But for now, I want to show you all the options. And we'll do plenty of examples that mimic what you'll be expected to do on the knowledge check and on the quiz. So this alternative hypothesis could be one of three options depending on what we expect to happen we could expect that there's just a significant effect. So that would be scenario A. So just saying that there's a significant effect, but not specifying what kind of significant effect we would expect to happen. So this is just saying that we think that Kaplan is going to change our sample from the population. Not saying if we think that their SAT scores are going to be higher or lower, just that they're going to be different. And this is called a two-tailed test. And that's because we will say that the findings are significant if the SAT scores for our sample of Kaplan test prep recipients is on the high or the low end of the distribution. And remember, those extreme ends of, those dis of the distribution, they look like tails. They're like little tails on the edge of the distribution where most people aren't falling. So that's a two-tailed test. And I'll show you plenty of examples that demonstrate why it's called a two-tailed test. But for now, just know a two-tailed test is when you have an alternative hypothesis where you're just expecting some sort of difference between the sample and population. Not specifically, will the sample have a higher mean or a lower mean compared to the population? You could have a situation, which is probably the realistic situation you would have, where you expect that people who take the Kaplan test prep course will have significantly higher SAT scores. Or in other words, their scores will significantly be increased 
So this would be called a one-tailed test, and it's a specifically to the high end of the distribution. So in order to say that there is a significant increase, the z-score that you calculate for your sample would have to fall to the far right of the mean, for the population mean, or the high end of the distribution in that one tail. It can't fall on the low end and be significant increase. Just the high end, so it's just one tail. And then the third option, taking Taplin test prep courses will significantly decrease SAT scores. So we're still being specific about which direction we expect the sample mean to fall relative to the population mean. But now we're thinking it's going to be lower than the population mean, a decrease. So it's still one-tailed, but this is the low end. So remember, when you find z-scores in your table, which you're going to be doing for the critical values, you need to keep in mind whether or not that z-score is positive or negative. So if you had a situation like this, you would need to keep in mind that that critical value you find for z in step two would be a negative value. Now before I move on to the null hypothesis, I want to break down these symbol versions of these hypotheses. And these are the way that I'll be expecting you to write this in a knowledge check or in a quiz situation. So this first one, the alternative hypothesis, that's what H1 stands for. And then this mu, it's not M, meaning sample mean, it's mu, meaning the population mean implied by the sample that we're studying. So remember, we're into inferential statistics now. We aren't so much concerned about the sample in of itself, but what we're concerned about is what the sample tells us about the population that they're meant to represent. So all of our hypotheses are stated in terms of the population mean that's implied by the sample. Because if our finding is significant, then we would expect to see the same results in the population. So mu not equal to 500. And in this case, 500 is the population mean. So when we write these out in symbols, you'll see you see 500, 500, 500. They're in reference to the original population mean. So this is going to be some number. It's not always going to be 500, but it'll be the number that represents the population mean. And this makes sense. The population mean implied by our sample is different, not equal to 500. Significant effect means that the SAT scores would not be equal to 500. They'd be significantly different from 500. This next one, scenario B. Alternative hypothesis, the population mean implied by our sample is greater than 500. So if Kaplan test prep increases SAT scores, well then we would expect our sample mean, or the population mean implied by our sample, to be larger than 500. We're expecting an increase in SAT scores. Then the third scenario, scenario C, we're expecting that Kaplan test prep will significantly decrease SAT scores. Then our, our alternative hypothesis would be that the population mean implied by the sample is less than the original population mean of 500. We're expecting a decrease here. So the second part of step one is stating the null hypothesis. So the opposite of what we expected to happen according to our alternative hypothesis. So we're still using the same example comparing a sample of Kaplan test prep takers, their SAT, to the population of SAT test takers. But the null hypothesis is going against the alternative. So in scenario A, we were expecting a significant effect. Well, here in scenario A, for the null hypothesis, what we don't expect, no significant effect. And so to break this down in symbols, the HO stands for the null hypothesis is that the population mean implied by the sample would not be significantly different from 500 or would be equal to 500, the original population mean. If there's no change, then it wouldn't be significantly different from by 500, and you could state this as equals 500. So then scenario B, where our, our alternative, we expected that Kaplan test prep courses would significantly increase SAT scores, or that SAT scores would be higher for the sample. 
Well, everything that's not an increase would be a decrease or no change. So, taking Kaplan test prep courses will decrease or have no significant effect on SAT scores. Not just that it has no effect whatsoever, but it could also decrease SAT scores and still go against our alternative hypothesis that states it will increase SAT scores. So in symbols, a null hypothesis, the population mean implied by the sample is less than or equal to 500, the original population mean. Less than, meaning it decreased, or equal to, it had no effect whatsoever. Scenario C, according to the alternative hypothesis, we would expect that taking Kaplan test prep would decrease SAT scores. So if it doesn't decrease, then it increases or doesn't change. So then the population mean implied by our sample would be greater than or equal to the original population mean, meaning it increased or didn't change it at all. So in hypothesis testing, we don't really aim to prove our expectations or the alternative hypothesis. We're really making inferences about the population based on a sample. So if you think about it, we're using incomplete information to make conclusions. As such, we never accept our alternative hypothesis because doing so may be an error. And with incomplete information, it's easier to reject a false hypothesis than to accept an alternative hypothesis is truth. So it's easier to reject a null with a certain degree of confidence than it would be to accept an alternative hypothesis as truth. So here is a silly example, and then I'll show you kind of a less silly example. So let's say that our null hypothesis was that no cats have four legs. And our alternative was that all cats have four legs. And we did a study to try to test this null hypothesis that no cats have four legs. So we collected a sample of five cats, and all these cats have four legs. Well, I can be pretty darn confident in rejecting this null hypothesis, because I'm looking at five cats right here that have four legs. So it's impossible that this statement is true. It's impossible that no cats have four legs. Super confident that that is easy to reject. I don't believe this for a second, based on my sample. But again, this is a sample. There's way more than five cats in the world. And so this may not be an accurate representation of the population. So it would not be easy to reject the alternative hypothesis that all cats have four legs, that there is some sort of difference probably happening among the cat community. I'm, I've seen a cat that has three legs before that doesn't really go with this alternative hypothesis. So it's easy to disprove a null statement saying that no, this isn't happening. But it's very difficult to prove a positive statement with a limited amount of information from a sample. So again, we are only going to be testing the null hypothesis when we are looking at hypothesis testing. And the only two decisions that can result from a hypothesis test, which we'll get to in step four, are rejecting the null or failing to reject the null. Because again, we're not really testing the alternative hypothesis because it's really difficult to have any confidence whatsoever in trying to prove that there's a positive statement that's true. Here's another example. So let's say that our alternative hypothesis is that the drug has an effect on pain. So let's say that we are giving fentanyl to cancer patients or somebody who's in some, some group that's in pain, and our alternative hypothesis is that the drug will have an effect on pain. The alternative could also be that it, it um, decreases pain. Then our null is that the drug just has no effect. It does nothing. Well, let's say that I do a more complicated type of study that we'll get to later in the semester, where we have a pretest and a post-test. And I have a group of people who are in serious pain. I mean, despite the fact that they're yellow, they're also in a lot of pain. They look very sad. And then I give them the drug, and it's all smiles. Well, based on this sample, 
limited information from the population of everybody who's experiencing pain, I can pretty easily reject this null hypothesis that the drug has no effect on pain. I know it has some sort of effect on at least someone because my sample is a lot happier after taking this drug. But it wouldn't be accurate to accept that the drug has an effect on pain for everyone because there may be some people who have different reactions or different tolerances to the drug and you may not see this specific reaction in the population at large. So just another example of why we test the null hypothesis and we really seek to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis but we never prove or accept an alternative hypothesis as truth because there can always be situations that don't go along with the alternative hypothesis. The only way that you could accept an alternative hypothesis is if you had access to every single person in the population. Okay, so the next step in a hypothesis test is determining the critical region. So determining the criteria for significance or the critical region identified by Z-critical in our case. We're going to have different test statistics throughout the semester, but for now let's focus on Z-critical. So Z-critical represents the cutoff for outcomes that have a very low probability if the null hypothesis is true. So we're no longer using z-score greater than the absolute value of 2 for extreme. We are going to have a specific z-value based on a couple pieces of information that we'll talk about in a minute that tell us if the findings are significant. So there's other ways to state this. Is it highly unlikely to obtain the sample from the population by chance? So you're going to be finding a z-score that's associated with a very low probability to see if the z-score you obtain in your sample falls into that low probability, that highly unlikely result. Another way to state this is how extreme must the z-score be to be considered significant? These are all different ways of talking about what the critical region tells you. So, in an experiment, you want to know how extreme must the z-score be to be confident that we would see a similar effect of the independent variable that we measured on the dependent variable in the population. So, for example, if we looked at this, and let's say that we randomly assigned one group to get Kaplan test prep and another group to not get Kaplan test prep, we could compare those two samples to see if there's a significant difference there. That would be an independent samples design, which we'll get to later. For our purposes with z-scores, we could just, like I mentioned earlier, take a sample, maybe give them Kaplan test prep, see if their mean on the SAT is significantly larger or different than the mean for the SAT in the population, and when we say that it's significantly different, we mean that it would be highly unlikely that we would get that sample mean just due to random chance. So that we're confident that we got that different sample mean from the population because of the Kaplan test prep. It's due to the independent variable, not due just to sampling error. If we had a correlational study, Maybe we could just ask 100 random people, did you take Kaplan test prep and what was your SAT score? And see what the relationship is there. And if there was a significant relationship, then we could be pretty confident that that relationship would exist in the population. Or in other words, if it fell in the critical region set by this z-score that represents highly unlikely results if the null hypothesis is true, then we could be confident that the null hypothesis is not true or, you know, we could reject the null and be pretty confident that the reason that there is a significant relationship in our sample is because there's actually a relationship in the population at large and not due to just some random fluke with our sample. So there's two pieces of information that are necessary to determine the z-critical. And you'll be looking up these critical values in the unit normal table that you've been working with with z-scores in the past couple of chapters. So the first thing that you need to know is this thing called the alpha level. And I'll give you the alpha level. You won't have to come up with this on your own. I'll just give it to you in the problem. But the alpha level dictates how extreme a sample must be. So when I say extreme, I mean how unlikely 
does a particular sample mean need to be for us to be confident that the sample mean is different in our case for now different from the population mean more it's really unlikely that we would see that difference between the sample and population mean just due to chance so if you have an alpha level of 0 0.05 this means that you are willing to reject the null hypothesis and say that you're finding is statistically significant if there's a 5% chance or less that you would randomly select a sample with this mean from the population. In other words, is this sample mean in the extreme 5% of the sampling distribution? Remember, the sampling distribution represents every single possible sample mean of a specific sample size from the population. So, it's that you do have some sort of probability of getting very, very extreme sample means just due to chance. But if it's highly unlikely, as dictated by how highly unlikely does it need to be, well, that's based on the alpha level, then we can be confident that it's so unlikely that we would get that sample mean just due to chance that we're pretty confident that the reason our sample mean is different from our population mean is because of whatever we manipulated with the independent variable. You can also um, have an alpha level of, well, you can really have an alpha level of anything, but the two most common are 0.05 and 0.01. So let's say you had an alpha level of 0.01. Well, then this means that in order to conclude that you have a statistically significant finding or that you would be confident that the results you observed in the sample will be observed in the population, your sample mean needs to fall in the extreme 1% of the sampling distribution. Or in other words, there needs to be a 1% chance or less that you would randomly select a sample of that size from that population just due to chance so that you're confident that the reason this sample mean is different is because of whatever you manipulated in that sample. Now they no longer represent the population. So that's the first piece of information you need for Z-critical, the alpha level or the proportion in the tail is really what it is. If it's 0.05, you would just look up P equals 0.05 in the tail and find the z-score that corresponds to a 5% chance or less of getting that sample mean. And there are some cases where you may be looking for something different than the alpha level in your table, and that gets at the one or two-tailed nature of your hypothesis. So if you have a two-tailed test, where you're going to be looking at either you know, extremely high or extremely low z-scores. You have to split your alpha level in two, and then you're going to be looking for your alpha level divided by two in the tail, and then you'll have a positive and a negative version of the same z-score. So again, the unit normal table is used to locate the starting point for extreme z-scores based on what z-score is at whatever the proportion is in the tail, it's based on the alpha level and the nature of hypothesis, be it one-tailed or two-tailed. And then you'll locate that z-score with the p-value in the unit normal table, and then just be mindful of positive and negative values. If it's a one-tailed test, you really want to be careful because it will be either positive or negative. If it's a two-tailed test, then your critical value that you find in the table will be both positive and negative on either end of the distribution. So here are some pictures to help you understand these critical regions. So I will use the unit normal table to show you where these critical z-scores that you see in the picture on the slide, where these critical z-scores come from. But first, let me break each one down, and then I'll find all of those critical values. So this represents scenario A. This represents scenario B and this represents scenario C. So remember in scenario A, we were just expecting that Kaplan test prep would have a significant effect on SAT scores. We didn't specify if it would increase or decrease SAT scores. So that gets at the one or two tailed in nature of the hypothesis test. That's a two tailed test. It can either be high or low and still be considered extreme or significant now. So that's this first group here. If we had an alpha level of 0.05, then we would need to split that alpha level in half, and 0.05 divided by 2 is 0.025. So we would have P equals 0.025 in the high end tail, 
and P equals 0.025 in the low end tail of the distribution. If it was a two-tailed test with an alpha level of 0.01, then you're splitting that alpha level into two tails. 0.01 divided by 2 is 0 0.005. P equals 0 0.005 in this high end. P equals 0 0.005 in this low end. And one thing I want to point out before I show you where the z-scores come from, there's the negative version of the z-critical the z and the positive version of the critical z-score. Negative version, positive version. So let's go ahead and look at the table. So if we're working with an alpha level of 0.05 and we're splitting it in half into 0.025, look for 0.025 in the tail. Keep on going, getting closer. Oh, 0.02, okay, 0.025, perfect, right there. 1.96 is the z-score that corresponds to 0 0.025 in the tail, and you see that right here. 0 0.01 split up gives you 0 0.005. Find 0 0.005 in the tail. Keep on going. 0 0.0051 and 0 0.0049. Well, these two are both 0 0.0001 points away from 0 0.005. Remember, you don't always find the exact proportions or probabilities in your table. So because these two are the exact same distance from the p-value in the tail that we're looking for, you go with the larger z-score. And that's because you always want to err on the side of caution. Instead of going with the smaller z-score, you go with the larger z-score so that it's more difficult to reject the null hypothesis, or in other words, more difficult to calculate a z-score that falls in the critical region, and you're less likely to reject the null hypothesis incorrectly and make something that's actually called a type 1 error. But we'll talk about type 1 error later. So there's your 2.58. Again, we're looking for p equals 0 0.005 in the tail because we took our 0.01 alpha level and divided it by 2 because we're using a two-tailed test. And these two are the same distance away from 0 0.005, so we go with the one that corresponds to the larger z-score, 2.58. And there you see that there. Scenario B, we were expecting under the alternative hypothesis that Kaplan test prep would improve SAT scores. So we've got a one-tailed test, and it's one-tailed because we're only concerned with this one end of the distribution, this one tail. So we're not splitting this alpha level anymore. We would be looking for all of that alpha level, 0.05 in the tail. These are both looking at outcomes that have a 5% chance or less probability of happening, or, you know, it's less 5% chance or less of getting that sample mean from this population just due to chance. But in this case, that 5% split up or that 0.05 is split up. In this case, it's all maintained in this one tail of the distribution. Same sort of thing happens when you're looking at a one-tailed test for an alpha level of 0.01. So still looking in the high end, only now we're being really, really, really cautious, right? It has to be the extreme 1% of the sampling distribution. You know, we have to have a 1% chance or less of randomly selecting a sample with that mean from this population just due to chance to conclude that we think Kaplan is really having a significant effect. It's not just that we got some random sample who had better SAT scores just due to chance. We really feel confident that Kaplan's working and it would work in the population. So let's find these critical values. So alpha level of 0.05, go into our table, find 0.05 in the tail. And let's see, 0.05. Oh, again, it's a toss-up between these two proportions in the tail. They're both 0 0.0005 away from 0.05, so we'll go with the larger z-score, the 1.65. And there you see that there. It's positive 1.65 because we're expecting higher scores in our sample mean compared to our population. Now, look here. Same exact z-score if we were in scenario C, where the alternative hypothesis says that Kaplan test prep will decrease SAT scores. 
So we're still looking for 0.05, alpha level is 0.05, 0.05 in the tail still gives you 1.65, but now it's the negative 1.65 because our alternative hypothesis is saying we expect lower scores. Now let's find this 2.33 critical value using the alpha level of 0.01 that is not split up, it's all maintained in that one tail. 0.01, where are you? Let's keep going. 0 0.0110, 0 0.0107, 0 0.0102, oh! 0 0.0099 is the closest to 0.01, and that gives you a z-score of 2.33. Same deal as before with the alpha level of 0 0.05. Here, we've got the positive version if we have a one-tailed test in the high end, and the negative version if we were using a one-tailed test in the low end. Like I mentioned before, in reality, you'll only be working with one of these sorts of critical regions based on the scenario that you're given and the actual type of hypothesis and alpha level that you're given. Please note too that in a test taking situation, although you are typically going to only be working with alpha levels of 0.05 and 0.01, you need to get very comfortable with using the table to find those values because in a quiz you're not going to have these. You're going to need to use the table. And once we move past z-scores into t-scores, you're not going to have such consistent critical values. So make sure you're comfortable using the table like I just showed you to find those critical values. Okay, so moving on to step three of the hypothesis test. So we're still working with comparing our sample of Kaplan test prep students, comparing their mean GPA, which as you see here is a 550, based on a sample of 25 Kaplan test prep students, comparing that to the population of SAT test takers with an SAT score of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. So step three is essentially what you guys did in chapter seven, just calculating the z-score. This should be the easy part. That's pretty much review for you guys. So let's go ahead and calculate that z-score. So first thing, remember, you need to find the standard error. And remember, the standard error just tells you how much of a difference would we expect to see between the sample of 25 and the population. What, how big of a difference would we expect it to see between those two means from the sample and the population just due to random chance, just due to error even if Kaplan had absolutely no effect whatsoever. And remember, that's based on the size of your sample. So if you have a larger sample, you would expect to have less error. And it's based on the standard deviation. If you have more spread and SAT scores in your population, well, chances are you're probably going to have more differences between your sample mean and your population mean just due to chance. Or in other words, more error. So let's find the standard error first. How much error would we expect to see, or how much difference would we expect to see between the sample mean and the population mean just due to chance, even if the null hypothesis is true and Kaplan had no effect whatsoever? So our standard error is equal to the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. In this case, the standard deviation is 100. The sample size is 25. So then this becomes 100 divided by the square root of 25 is 5, and we end up with 20 for our standard error. So in other words, we would expect a 20 point difference between the sample's SAT score, mean SAT score, and the population's mean SAT score, even if the null hypothesis is true and Kaplan had no effect whatsoever. All right the z-score. So that's the sample mean minus the population mean divided by that standard error. So comparing what's the actual difference between the population mean and the sample mean to the difference we would expect to see just due to chance. All right? Sample mean is 550. Population mean is 500. And we're dividing that by our newly found standard error of 20, you end up with 50 divided by 20 and 2.5 is your z-score or your z-observed.
So what this actually tells you, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but this says that the obtained mean difference between the Kaplan sample and the population is 2.5 times bigger or larger than the difference that we would expect to see if the Kaplan course had no effect and all the observed differences were just due to chance or just due to sampling error. So that's pretty substantial. That's a pretty large difference. I'm not going to call it significant yet, though, because I haven't compared it to my critical region. So the next step is the final step in the hypothesis test. And this is where we make our decision and then state the conclusion based on that decision. So I've mentioned this before, but it's important to mention again, there are only two decisions possible. Remember, we're testing the null hypothesis. We're trying to disprove a false statement. So we can either re reject the null hypothesis, which means that the Z observed that we calculated in step three falls in that critical region that we found in the table from step two, or fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that the Z that we calculated, the test statistic based on our sample, does not fall in the critical region set by the value that we found in the table from step two. So when you state your conclusion after you make your decision, you need to First of all, base it on the decision. So if you fail to reject the null hypothesis, then you'll say that it's not significant. Whereas if you reject the null hypothesis, you'll say that it is significant. And the one or two tailed nature of the original hypothesis. So you want your conclusion to follow the original hypothesis. And it's important to note too that let's say that your original hypothesis was two tailed, but then you find that your Z score is large and positive and it falls in the critical region. Well, you can't then change your conclusion to say that in this case, Kaplan test prep significantly increased SAT scores. You need to leave it as it had a significant effect on SAT scores. You don't want to start changing the hypothesis after you have the data in front of you and you've ran the test. And as you'll see in a little while, it's important not to do that because it's easier to reject a null hypothesis when you have a one-tailed test than it is to reject a null hypothesis when you have a two-tailed test. So you don't want to start with a two-tailed thing and then change it to a one-tailed test, but you're really undermining the strength of the hypothesis test. So just to kind of show you, if you look back, see in the one-tailed scenario with the same alpha level, you have a smaller critical value than you do in the two-tailed test, and that's because you're finding z-scores associated with lower probabilities when you're splitting that alpha level. And as you get farther out in the distribution, your probabilities get smaller and your z-scores get larger, relatively larger. Also, when you state your conclusion, make sure that you include whatever the independent variable is, whatever the dependent variable in the study is, and the word significant. Even if it's not significant, you want to include the word significant and just say that it's not significant. So remember in scenario A, we said that the null hypothesis was that the Kaplan test prep would just have no effect. So the population mean implied by the sample is still equal to or not significantly different from the original population mean. Scenario B, we expected under the alternative that Kaplan test prep would improve SAT scores. So the null hypothesis is that it would decrease or not change SAT score from the population mean. And then in scenario C, the alternative hypothesis, we expected that Kaplan test prep would decrease SAT scores. So the null is that they would increase or not change SAT scores from the population mean. And remember in step three, we calculated Z observed to be 2.5. All of this information is important when you go to look at the decisions. So we could reject the null hypothesis in scenario A, where this is our null hypothesis, because that Z observed that we calculated in step three, and as you'll see, the Z observed doesn't change across these different scenarios. The data is still the same, the sample means still the same, population means still the same, standard deviation for the population is still the same. The only thing that's different is the nature of the hypothesis. And let's go ahead and say that we're only working with an alpha level of 0.05, which is the typical alpha level that's worked with. So let's say, scenario A, you can reject the null hypothesis. That alpha level of 0.05 resulted in a 
critical value of plus or minus 1.96, and the Z observed of 2.5 falls into that critical region. So this would be the picture you'd be working with. And I strongly encourage you in step two to draw your distribution and draw or maybe even shade in your critical values. So in scenario A, the z-score of 2.5 that you calculated in step three does exceed the z-score set in the critical region. It falls in this critical region. So if your calculated test statistic falls in the critical region, in the tails, or goes beyond the critical value in the tail, these would be the places where it would need to fall to reject a null hypothesis and say that your findings were statistically significant. If it doesn't fall in the critical region, if it's closer to the mean than the z-scores that are set out here for the critical values, the critical region, then you would fail to reject the null hypothesis. Let's go back. Scenario B, you would reject the null hypothesis. This observed test statistic of 2.5 exceeds the critical region in the high end of the distribution set by the critical value of 1.65 that we found earlier. So if we look at that picture, here's our critical value of 1.65. 2.5 falls in that critical value. It exceeds that critical value. It's in the critical region. Reject the null. Then in scenario C, where we were expecting that Kaplan test prep would decrease test scores, well, in this case, we would have to fail to reject the null. Yeah, this 2.5 is a pretty extreme score, but it's in the wrong end of the distribution. Remember, if we're expecting a decrease or a lower sample mean, then our critical value is in the low end, the negative z-score for the critical value, and we wouldn't see that our obtained statistic falls in that region. See, this is our critical region now because we were expecting decreases or a smaller sample means, so this 2.5 does not fall in that critical region. And if that was the scenario we were working with, we would fail to reject the null. Now remember, like I said before, you want your conclusion to match the original hypothesis, be it one or two-tailed. So for scenario A, we would say results suggest Kaplan test prep, the independent variable, had a significant, there's that keyword significant, effect on SAT scores, our dependent variable. I didn't say significant increase because the original hypothesis was just that there would be an effect. Scenario B, results suggest Kaplan test prep significantly increased SAT scores. We've got our independent variable, our dependent variable, and significantly increased. We're being specific about what the direction or how, the, how it changed between the sample and population because our hypothesis originally was that specific. Then in scenario C, Remember, we failed to reject the null in that scenario because that 2.5 was in the wrong end of the distribution. Results suggest Kaplan test prep did not significantly decrease SAT scores. We've got our independent variable, our dependent variable, and even though we failed to reject the null, we still have the word significantly and that it was not a significant decrease. Remember, we expected a decrease in the alternative hypothesis. So this example illustrated all of the possible hypotheses which can be generated from a single research question. Typically, you'll be given specific, specific hypotheses to test. You'll need to look for clues in your knowledge check and quiz problems that tell you if the hypothesis is one or two-tailed. So for example, let's say that you had a question that said, do the data indicate a significant difference in rated attractiveness when the women appeared to have a tattoo? Well, there we're just looking for a difference. We're just expecting a difference. We're not really specifying if it's going to be less or more attractive. So the difference could be either way. It would be a two-tailed test. You would need to know that based on the scenario in the study. Well, what if the problem was restated as, do the data indicate a significant decrease in rated attractiveness when the women appeared to have a tattoo? Decrease, that's concerned with the low end, sample means that are lower than the population mean, and that would be a one-tailed test in the low end your Z critical would be a negative value. So just be mindful of that when you read your problems in your knowledge checks or your quizzes. So here is another example of a hypothesis test. And let's now say that we are looking to see if 
a sample who receives on-the-job training has a significantly different sample mean on job knowledge compared to the population. And let's say that we have a sample size of 36, and we're looking at comparing them to a population with a mean job knowledge of 50 and a standard deviation of 12 on some job knowledge exam. So again, we're looking at a sample who receives on-the-job training, and let's say that their mean is 55. So all the work is already done for you here. You can see, all right, the question is, is the sample mean sufficient to conclude that on-the-job training had a significant effect? Significant effect, we're not supposing that it improved job knowledge or had a negative effect on job knowledge, just some sort of effect. So this is a two-tailed test. That's reflected in your hypothesis. So two-tailed test under the null hypothesis, the population mean implied by the sample would still equal the original population mean. The alternative hypothesis, what we actually expect to happen, some sort of effect, the population mean implied by the sample would not be equal to the original population mean because we're expecting that this sample no longer represents this population. They're significantly different. They have different job knowledge because they received this training that changed them in some way. Then in step two, you could locate the critical value in the critical or in the unit normal table. Remember, alpha level is 0.05, divide that by two, you get that 0 0.005, find that in the tail, locate the z-score that it is representative of, and then you've got the positive and the negative version of that z-score because we're looking at a two-tailed test. So when you write your critical value in step two, if it's a two-tailed test, I expect to see positive and negative, whatever that value is. Also, drawing it out helps a whole lot. All right, step three, calculate your standard error, and then use that to calculate your z-score. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. This is just review. You've done this before. You get the z-score of 2.5, and guess what? That does not fall in this critical region. So you'll see the little red arrow meaning that we failed. We're failures. We failed to reject the null hypothesis. One way to kind of remember this that's probably not appropriate is that we don't like the hoe. See this hoe here? We don't like that hoe. That hoe is the null hypothesis, and that hoe goes against what we expect in the alternative hypothesis. So we don't want to be failures. We don't want to fail to reject that no hoe. We want to reject the hoe. So we're failures when we don't because what we expected to happen didn't really pan out. So there you go. Hopefully that helps. All right. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis because our observed Z statistic from our sample isn't extreme enough to be considered significant. In other words, there is not a 1% or less chance that we would get a sample with this mean, or higher in this case, with this Z score just due to chance. We're not willing to say that we're confident in the results, in other words. There's too much of a probability that we would get this sample just due to chance and not due to the fact that on-the-job training actually changed their job knowledge levels. So then our conclusion, on-the-job training does not have a significant effect on the job knowledge exam. You've got your independent variable, on-the-job training, the word significant, in line with the original hypothesis, just significant effect, and then our dependent variable, job knowledge exam. Here's another example where we're still looking at a sample of 36 employees, comparing them to a population with job knowledge with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 12, and the sample mean is 55. But now our alpha level is 0.05. So we're willing to reject the null hypothesis if there's a 5% or less chance of getting the sample mean just due to chance, even if the job knowledge exam doesn't have any effect. Or in other words, our sample mean has to fall in the extreme 5% of the sampling distribution so that we can be confident that we would observe similar results in the population, or confident that if we gave on the job training to all employees, they would also have similar changes in job knowledge. Still doing a two-tailed test, just looking for a significant effect. So our null and alternative hypothesis is exactly the same as before. The only thing really that's changed so far is that in step two, 
we're doing a two-tailed hypothesis test. So we have to split that alpha level. And when you split that alpha level in two, you end up with 0.025 in each tail. And that gives you a Z critical of plus or minus. Remember, two-tailed test, both plus and minus, positive and negative Z scores, 1.96. The Z statistic has not changed. You're still working with the same sample, comparing it to the same population. But now, this 2.5 does fall in the critical region. We can reject the null hypothesis and rejoice and say on-the-job training has a significant effect on the job knowledge exam. Now, the results are unlike example one. Remember, example one, the results were not significant. We failed to reject the null hypothesis. But in this example two, we do reject the null hypothesis, and that's because we have a larger alpha level. We're willing to accept a higher probability that sampling error is the reason why we observed a difference between the sample and the population. So when you have a larger alpha level, it's easier to get significant results because the Z critical value is smaller. So it's when you're looking at this, the alpha level if it's 0.05 in this case, we have a smaller Z critical than when our alpha level is a smaller 0.01. We have larger Z critical values. And that's because as we get into smaller proportions or probabilities within our distribution, we're getting further out on either end of the distribution. Our Z scores increase. We're getting farther away from the mean. These z-scores still tell you how many standard deviations away any specific score is from the mean. And remember, as you get farther away from the mean, the z-scores increase in magnitude. Okay, so it's, easy, it's, it's easier to get significant results when you have a larger alpha level. And in some cases, we're willing to accept a 5% chance that our sample mean was due to sampling error and not the independent variable. But in some cases, especially like medical research, we're only willing to conclude that results are significant if there is a 1% chance or lower chance that a sample with this mean would be selected by chance, or in other words, through sampling error. So here is another example. And now we've got a sample that has 16 employees in it, whereas before we were looking at a sample of 36. Everything in this example is the same as example two, except for the sample size. So we've got our same non-alternative hypothesis, and our Z critical is still positive or negative 1.96, just like before, still doing a two-tailed test with an alpha level of 0.05. But now the z-score is different because we have a smaller sample size, so we have a larger standard error. So here, we you know, we are saying that we would expect to see a three-point difference in job knowledge between the sample mean and the population mean just due to chance. Whereas here, we were only expecting a two-point difference due to chance because we had a larger sample that's probably going to be more representative of the population. And from a calculation standpoint, we had a larger number in the denominator of the standard error, so the overall value was smaller than when we had a smaller value in the denominator of standard error, we have a larger value overall. Here, the Z observed, when you calculate it with this new standard error, the mean difference hasn't changed, but the standard error has, you have a smaller Z score. So this is saying that the observed difference in job knowledge between the sample mean and the population mean is 1.67 times larger than what would be expected by chance, but that's not large enough for us to say that the z-score falls in the critical region and that we could reject the null hypothesis. So we failed in this case. So now we fail to reject the null. Our observed z statistic does not fall in the critical region, and results suggest that on-the-job training does not have a significant effect on the job knowledge exam. So this example is no longer significant like example two, even though we're using the same population with the same sample mean and the same alpha level, we had a larger sample size last time than we do now. So again, the larger sample size, it's easier to get significant results because your standard error is smaller.
And this is okay, because with larger samples, we're also more confident in our results. Larger samples are more representative of the population, so if some effect exists, we'll be able to detect it more accurately. So now let's go ahead and do example four. So this example is identical to example three. The only difference is that now we're being pretty specific. We are saying that we think that on-the-job training will significantly increase exam scores. So based on this, we know we're working with a one-tailed test in the high end. So we're no longer splitting that alpha level into two tails. We're now maintaining it all in one tail, specifically the high end of the distribution, with a positive Z crit. And that also changes our hypotheses. So if we're expecting that on-the-job training significantly increased exam scores, then under the alternative hypothesis, we're expecting that the population mean implied by our sample is larger than the original population mean of 50. And what goes against that? That crazy hoe that goes against us saying that it's less than or equal to 50. So if it's not greater than 50, it's less than or equal to 50, meaning that it decreased or didn't change the job knowledge scores. Then step two, you would just find 0.05 in the tail, and that corresponds to the z-score of 1.65. Not positive or negative, remember, because it's not a two-tailed test. It's just the positive version of that critical value because we're only looking in the high end of the distribution because we're expecting a significant increase. Step three, you get the same observed z-score that you got in example two because everything's the same other than the fact that we have a one-tailed test. And now, magically, we can reject the null hypothesis, whereas before we failed to reject the null hypothesis because... When you have a two-tailed test, like I mentioned before, you're going to have higher values for your z-critical or smaller critical regions. Compared to when you have a one-tailed test, you have a smaller critical value, and it's easier to have your observed test statistic fall into that critical value. So now we can say on-the-job training significantly increases. Remember, keep it in line with the original research question, the original hypothesis increases scores on the job knowledge exam. We've got our independent variable on the job training, the word significant, the word increase, because it's a one-tailed test, we want to be specific, and job knowledge exam, our dependent variable. So, so far, I've talked a lot about the statistical significance of a finding or of research. So statistical significance just means that it's so unlikely that we would get a sample with that mean just due to chance that we're pretty confident that we got that sample mean that's so different because of whatever we manipulated in the sample. Or in other words, we're confident that whatever we did to the sample would probably happen in the population if by some miracle we were able to have access to the entire population. So Again, it just tells you, statistical significance tells you that the results of the study are very unlikely to have occurred if there's no treatment effect and the null hypothesis is true. Practical significance of an effect is all about the absolute magnitude of a treatment effect independent of the sample size being used. Because remember, large sample sizes have a low standard error and increase the likelihood of obtaining significant results, even if the independent variable has a very minimal impact on the dependent variable. So practical significance is kind of like the so what. It's statistically significant, but how much of an impact is the independent variable really having on the dependent variable? Because if you think about on-the-job training, for example, it's pretty expensive to implement. And if it has a really small but statistically significant effect, it may not be worth the improvement in job knowledge it would result if it's a small improvement. So one of the most common measures of effect size for z-scores is Cohen's d. And Cohen's d is calculated by taking the sample mean minus the population mean and then dividing that by the population standard deviation. And remember, the standard deviation is not impacted by the sample size. It's just based on the original population standard deviation. So even if you have a really, really large sample size, which increases the likelihood of getting a statistically significant effect, even if the independent variable doesn't have a huge impact on the dependent variable, that's not going to be a factor here. But it is worth noting that if you do a statistical analysis and your results are not significant, 
there's really no point in looking at effect size. Okay, Cohen's D, formula's right here, and it just tells you the size of the treatment effect in terms of standard deviations. So if I wanted to calculate Cohen's D based on the example that we've been using so far, sample mean was 55, population mean is 50, 55 minus 50 gives you 5. Divide that by the population standard deviation, not the standard error, but the standard deviation, and you end up with 0.42. Now, this tells you that on average, on-the-job training improves exam scores by 0.42 standard deviations, or 0.42 times 12, 5 points. Well, we kind of already knew that when we look at the difference between the sample mean and the population mean. There's a 5-point difference. What really helps interpret the effect size is this evaluation of effect size. So the statistical gods decided, actually Cohen decided, that these are the different criteria for effect size. So if you have a Cohen's D that's around 0.20, you would say it's a small effect. If it's around 0.50, a medium effect. If it's around 0.80, a large effect, and any D that you calculate that's greater than 0.80, we would say that's a very large effect. If we had a Cohen's D for on-the-job training and job knowledge that was around 0.80 or larger, we would be implementing, implementing that on-the-job training immediately. It has a really large effect. A medium effect is still pretty good. And I'm calling this medium because it's closer to 0.50, but depending on the cost, we may not want to implement it. Now, let's say that maybe we had a situation where we had D equals 0.35. So it's like smack dab in the middle of small and medium. In a quiz situation, if you want to call it a small to medium effect to cover all your bases, that's totally fine. So finally, I want to talk about type 1 and type 2 error. So type 1 error is really just rejecting a true null hypothesis. So anytime that you reject a null hypothesis, you are at risk of type 1 error. And type 1 error just means that you reject the null hypothesis, you say findings are significant, and in reality, the only reason that you had such an extreme sample mean was actually due to sampling error, due to just chance random you got a really extreme sample mean just due to chance, not due to the independent variable. Now, the neat thing about the alpha level is that the alpha level is the probability that the sample mean would be randomly selected from the sampling distribution or from the population just due to chance. So the alpha level is the probability of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis when the independent variable actually has no effect, and the null hypothesis is actually true. So that gets at the rejecting a true null hypothesis. And the alpha level is just the probability of type 1 error. So let's say our alpha level is 0.05. Then we're really just saying that we're willing to accept a 5% chance of type 1 error. Or in other words, like I've been saying all along, a 5% chance of obtaining a sample mean in the critical region even if the null is true. Most researchers are willing to confident re re confidently reject the null hypothesis if the probability of type 1 error is equal to or less than 5%, in other words, an alpha level of 0.05. But like I mentioned before, some studies, especially medical studies, where the findings are going to be used to implement drug treatments for patients, some studies like that will base significance on having a maximum 1% chance of type 1 error, or an alpha level of 0.01. It is a serious problem if type 1 error occurs. So you may administer a drug to cancer patients that doesn't actually work. We found that it was significantly improved, you know, prognosis of cancer patients in our sample, but we just had a very extreme sample just due to chance, and it really wasn't the drug that had the effect. It was just sampling error. Type 1 error is also a big problem if you publish a study with erroneous claims of significance and others waste their time trying to replicate your findings. Or if you have to have the embarrassment of redacting, finding, redacting findings in a publication because replication hasn't panned out and it hasn't supported your original claims. That being said, I really want you guys to understand that type 1 error doesn't refer to part purposeful falsification of results or the result of a methodological or statistical mistake. 
It simply happens when the researcher uses limited information, a sample, that is incorrect through no fault of the researcher, just extreme sample mean due to chance. Even random assign a random selection can result in sampling error that can be substantial enough to make you reject a null hypothesis incorrectly. So for example, maybe a researcher randomly selects employees who already have high levels of job knowledge. Thus, even, on, even if on-the-job training didn't actually have an effect on job knowledge, the sample would score higher than the population on the exam. They had higher job knowledge to begin with, even though it had nothing to do with the independent variable on the job training, and the null was actually true. Now, type 2 error is just the probability of falsely rejecting or failing to reject a false null hypothesis. So, you reject the null hypothesis when the treatment or the independent variable actually does have an effect. So, the failure to detect an effect that actually exists is type 2 error. And this is usually due to either small effects, small effect sizes, or small sample sizes. So remember, even if there's a pretty large difference between your sample mean and population mean, if you have a really small sample size, your standard error in the denominator of your test statistic is going to be really large, and it's going to be difficult to get a large enough test statistic, or z-score in this case, to fall in the critical region and reject the null hypothesis. So the implications for type 2 error are less severe than for type 1 error. The researcher may be disappointed that they didn't obtain the results they expected, because we always want to get significant results. So oftentimes, the researcher will just replicate the experiment with improvements. Maybe they'll have a larger sample size or try a different manipulation of an independent variable, and then they'll retest their hypothesis. If you think about it, if the researcher is testing the effectiveness of a cancer treatment that actually does have a positive impact on patients, but the researcher fails to find st statistically significant results, or in other words, incorrectly fails to reject the null hypothesis, the implications aren't that severe, because in all likelihood, the failure to find a significant effect is probably due to the drug having a very small effect size on patients, and so even though some effect exists, they probably wouldn't benefit that much from getting the drug anyway because there was such a small effect that the researcher wasn't able to detect it using a study. Now, the chapter talks about this thing called power, and power is all about finding the probability of type 2 error. But power requires a priori or in advance expectation of the size of the effect, and it's extremely rare to really know what the size of the effect will be before conducting the study. So I don't have you guys actually do power in this class, but if you're interested in it, it is in the chapter, and they explain it pretty well. All I want you to know that as the sample size increases, the probability of type 2 error decreases. So that is all I have for you when it comes to hypothesis testing. I'm very enthusiastic about it because it is exciting stuff. It helps you understand what the heck does it mean when somebody tells you that findings were significant. And we are going to be doing these four steps for the rest of the semester. We're going to be using different test statistics and different types of study scenarios, but those four steps will be something that you will see for the rest of the semester. So I hope you understand them really well and you learn to love them as much as I do.